Welcome back to SuperCloud 4, where we explore the evolution of generative AI and its impact on company strategies and industry transformations. You know, very often, tectonic shifts in enterprise tech start in consumer markets. The ascendancy of the PC, for example, gave Wintel, i.e. Microsoft software and the Intel x86 architecture, the scale it needed to crack into the enterprise market. The iPhone gave rise to mobile apps, flash storage, and ARM processors, which have all found their way into enterprise technology. And our next guest is Sridhar Ramaswamy. He's a senior vice president for AI at Snowflake, a company that acquired Neva in May of this year, which is a company that Sridhar co-founded. Neva was a consumer search company that ran into the Google search monster and then pivoted with Gen AI to enterprise search and is now helping simplify the Snowflake customer experience across a variety of industries and use cases. Sridhar, welcome, good to see you again. <laughs> it's great to see you, Dave, excited to chat. So in June at uh, the Snowflake Summit, we talked about what was a most interesting use case to me, and that is, as a customer, I want to access some table, let's say, with, that has some important data that I want to get to, and I'm going to do that in natural language. I'm going to bring up a Streamlit app you described, Streamlit, of course, is another Snowflake acquisition to build data science apps. And through my natural language commands, it all happens behind the scenes. It, first of all, is that still the right vision? How has that evolved? And, and where are you in terms of making that a reality for your customers? Uh, that's right. Part of what is incredibly exciting about AI itself, um, generative AI, there are applications, but the core technology of AI um, is that as you point out, it's a natural language. You can speak to it, you can write things, um, and it can extract the structured information that is, uh, that is underneath um, and for surface it to you. Um, at Snowflake, we are building a set of technology capabilities deep into the platform. Um, part one, we are running language models within Snowflake so that you can access them, whether it's from SQL or a Streamlit app or your own application without having to bring up GPUs, without having to do all of the hard work. Um, so that is basically inferencing at scale that we host. Um, we're also integrating the Neva search technology, um, which is a combination of old school information retrieval plus vector indexing natively uh, into Snowflake so that you're able to just with a single command index, index a table. Uh, and now where it all comes together is in, for example, a Streamlit app that you talked about um, where you can talk to a table. We're also creating a co-pilot experience that builds on top of the inferencing platform and the vector indexing so that you can talk to it in English, it writes the SQL queries, and then you can click a button um, and, uh, and, and have, that, have that run. It is that fluid access to data that further will democratize access to all of the great structured information that's sitting in Snowflake, um, and we are absolutely on our way to, to getting this done. We have a series of announcements coming up in roughly a month uh, in, in Snow Day. It's a pretty exciting time and we are moving incredibly quickly. Yeah, so I mean, we just got together, it was just over 90 days ago, which isn't that long ago, but of course in, these, in this day and age, that's a, that's a long time. Uh, what has changed? Are there any learnings uh, since we last sat down in June that, that you can share? Yeah, I would say uh, the thing that's been most exciting over the past 90 days is of course the rise of uh, open source language models um, and the role that Meta is increasingly playing um, in the language model space. Uh, and so Lama2 has turbocharged a lot of efforts. We have a great partnership with, uh, uh, with Meta, but of course we are also pre-training our own models uh, so I think it's just provided a lot of impetus to the ecosystem, which at the beginning of the year looked like it would pretty much only be a handful of players like OpenAI, uh, like Anthropic, and the much anticipated uh, Gemini model um, from, from Google. So I think this, um, uh, this, this sort of rise in open source and the democratization of AI models uh, is an important development. I think the other, less relevant to enterprise, but the other equally important development is that uh, it's very clear that uh, ChatGPT, as well um, as Sydney, which is Bing's chatbot, uh, have topped out in terms of how many people they have reached. 
And so what looks what looked early on in the year as a sweep the table move from OpenAI and Microsoft is now sputtering a little bit on the consumer side. So I think that will influence a lot of how does search evolve, what does Google do, um, even what is going to, you know, um, what is going to happen with like people's perception of how unshakable Google is. Um, lots of excitement in, um, in, in multiple places. Um, but the core thing that is also becoming very, very clear is that, you know, contrary to popular belief, um, consumer might not be the biggest AI hit. It's people like Snowflake um, and Salesforce that are integrating AI deep into their platforms and making it possible for their customers to do more. Um, but I got to tell you, this story is changing like by the month. And that's part of what is exciting about working in it. And I want to come back to that, that notion of enterprise and some of the specific use cases there. But, but first I want to talk about some of the challenges of, of adopting AI, you know, I love, love the all-in podcast, when I, but when I listen to those guys, it's like, oh yeah, you flick a switch and all of a sudden you can just deploy AI. And it's, it's, it's not that simple. It is on one hand to create experiments, on the other hand, to actually create value. So I wonder, Alex, if you could bring up the slide. This is data from a ETR survey this month. Uh, ETR is our, our, our data partner. And no matter which industry you filter on, overwhelmingly the blocker to moving into production is we're still in the evaluation phase. That's that big bar uh, on the left. And oh yeah, right behind that are data privacy, security, legal and compliance concerns. You know, the, the lawyers are definitely in control. You know, nothing else really stands out. It doesn't seem that budget is you know, generally a concern because they're stealing from other areas. There's no perceived lack of value. The point is despite the narrative that this stuff is easy to do, it's actually, you know, not so simple. It needs to be made easy, but today maybe not so much the so street are, does your data align, your, your information when you talk to customers align with this and, and what can be done about it? What specifically are you doing about it? Yeah, I think this is where, you know, um, all technologists and the media have to be careful about sort of not setting expectations so high that they cannot possibly be met. I'll give you a simple example. Um, everybody is like, hey, talk to chat GPT. Um, it is the most amazing thing since sliced bread. It's fine. I have a you know chat GPT subscription. I pay 20 bucks a month. I'm happy to pay it, but I have to think really hard about what questions I want to ask it because I know that if I ask it obscure questions, it is just going to hallucinate. Um, uh, meaning it's going to make up stuff, uh, which means that instantly that cannot be part of a business application. People cannot use what comes out of that to make actual decisions. I'm very proud of the fact that like starting last year, we recognized that language models had magical capabilities. Their ability to take like a 1500 word blog and write an accurate four sentence summary is nothing short of miraculous. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that you get to roll it out into an application and give it in the hands of, uh, of users. So we pioneered it, pioneered a technique called drag, um, retrieval augmented generation, or you can just think of that as smart search um, that you need to use in conjunction with the language model in order to produce believable output. This is exactly what we are in the process of doing at Snowflake. It's taking us a few months, but we want to be, you know, we want to have that index that can set the context for a language model to always produce believable, authentic information. And we would much rather have our system say like, hey, you know, I can't answer that. Not all questions are answerable in the context of a data that a particular database has. It is the basics of how do you create value? How do you make sure that it is believable? How do you make sure that you don't over promise? Um, that I think the sort of the early hype around AI is severely misjudged and so we are now going through the graph that you talked about where people are like, oh, it's nice. Three answers are great, but two, polite fiction. What do we do with that? Or, you know, your second bar, people are going, oh, you mean like I have to take all my data out of my database that I've spent years getting in gear and stick it into another index or into another model? How exactly is access control going to work? This is why with the things that we are implementing, we make sure that governance and security are right in there from the very beginning so that like we actually have applications where people can feel like, okay, only the people that are supposed to look at some data are actually allowed to look at that data. 
on the legal issues we are getting through, we actually had like, you know, a, a big power with the legal department internally at Snowflake about what are our policies for what data we can use to train models for fine tuning, how do we assure our customers that their data is never going to be used um, for uh, any kind of common you know, tuning of models across? Um, how does liability work? This comes up often. People go like, oh, I see. So you're using this open source model, but if we get sued, who's going to bear copyright liability for stuff like that? So this is just stuff that every company has to work through, as I said, with every new piece of technology, um, we just assume that all of these things are going to just magically happen. But to your point, some of these were led by consumer products, where we can get consumers to pretty much agree to anything. But in the enterprise, people ask more questions. So I think the delays are uh, predictable, um, but the rock solid technology from places like Snowflake um, is fast hitting the market and you will see people um, that get real value out of it. But even we are going to say like, hey, this is not magic. Start with the simple ones. For example, a chatbot over a bunch of documentation. We know how to do this and that can be made super reliable. It's things like applications like that that get you into the crawl phase and then we can get into more complicated things like write SQL and run it automatically. That's like more in the walk and run phases. Um, there's 100% value to be created. It's just going to take a few months. Um, but on the other hand, this is still lightning fast by enterprise standards. And to your point there, Sridhar, the data shows, and when you talk to customers, they'll, they'll confirm this. When you look at the actual use cases in production, they're essentially taking ChatGPT or some kind of similar tool to generate code, provide chat support. Maybe they're writing marketing copy or summarizing text to legal firms. And while that's all well and good, your vision is broader. And so what are you seeing in terms of the possible use cases that are, that are being evaluated you know, beyond these initially simple ones? Are there, are there specific ones that you can point to or patterns that stand out that are exciting you? I Look, like a really important part of language models is literally what the two words say, which is their proficiency with language. It is easy to discount all of the simple applications like the summarization, like the translation, uh, like the ability to create a chatbot over known data. But in terms of efficiency, they're pretty amazing. Um, part of what we are going to do as part of the Snowflake platform is not just host a set of models, um, but we're going to make it easily accessible in SQL, which means that the thousands of data analysts that are working in every large company all of a sudden have access to language models in the SQL that they write without needing to deal with GPUs, deal with APIs, deal with keys, deal with a whole new like billing system, internal approvals, procurement, none of that stuff. That stuff just works. Um, and to me, like that is actually a significant value add uh, to how like companies use Snowflake, to how products work. Um, and I would not discount the simple use cases as not delivering value. They're going to deliver a lot of value, but there's a but. Um, I think it is when they get really good enough to be able to take an English question, write a piece of SQL, get you the answer, and like summarize and point out interesting things in the answer. Or even better, let's say as an enterprise, you have your own APIs. Uh, the example that I give people is, um, you know, let's take a shipping company. They have all of the packages um, that uh, have been shipped out in Snowflake so that we can know like, hey, what are packages that are still, um, you know, that Dave is going to get. But there's a different system, let's say, that is currently storing where that package is actually located. What models can do is now you can create a chatbot that you put in front of the customers of the shipping company, and they'd be able to ask questions like, oh, where is this package um, that you know, I am expecting from a Wayfair, uh, let's say, which is a Boston company. And uh, the model will then decide, ah, I'm going to use Snowflake to look up the packages, but I'm going to use this other API in order to figure out where that package actually is. It is that ability to fluidly blend in different kinds of applications um, that I think is going to be powerful. And we have so far 
in the context of enterprise, not even touched on the generative use cases. You talked about marketing copy, um, but I can think of other things like uh, personalization of image creatives, um, using data, say, from a uh, Salesforce connector coming into Snowflake, you use that and other characteristics of your customers to write custom newsletters, to be able to create custom images. Um, I think the generative applications will also come. I don't know if you have played around with things like, uh, you know, video generation like Runway ML. Um, I, it's early. I find that stuff like fascinating. Um, so I think there's a lot to come. It, it will take, uh, it will take time. Yeah, and what we're playing around with is actually creating, you know, short takes from our videos, which the yeah. AI is doing. We there used to be a human that actually did that. You know, the poor guy was like an air traffic controller. Um, and, and your point about, uh, you know, not discounting some of these early use cases, I think, is well taken. I mean, at the same time, it's it's quite amazing. I guess I would say as well, uh, it's quite amazing to me the the adoption in terms of experimentation. I mean, even when you think about the cloud it took a much, much longer time for the cloud to reach this type of experimentation level. So it's huge. The but is, if you had a handicap, when do you think we'll go from this broad experimentation uh, to, to more meaningful deployments and, and deeper ROI? And, and what do you think would be the catalyst? Could you, do you have any sort of handicapping uh, uh, vision there? Yeah, so I would say by the, um, you know, by the beginning, of the calendar year next year, I think you're going to see, uh, you know, both from Snowflake and other people, access to lots and lots of models from simple things that people know a lot of, like SQL. And our take is that combining SQL and Streamlit to write interesting applications, people are going to come up with some crazy stuff that will be incredibly valuable. So I think the first wave um, is going to come early next year. Um, there are people that have built chatbots by stitching together things like, oh, let me take some data, put it into, you know, a, a, a pine cone or some other vector database, and then use uh, something like OpenAI to create a chatbot. That's a great demo. But as I said, people immediately go like, okay, so what is your data story? Um, you know, how do you make sure that you have good governance on that? I think those sorts of applications will begin to roll out in Q1. But you'll see, I think, a lot more of that in like Q1, Q2 next year. Um, but models are also making crazy progress. I think you're going to see generative applications, especially in the context of marketing, um, uh, where you can experiment because you're putting these ads in some external platform like a Facebook, like uh, you know, like a Google. Um, so I would say this is a matter of small number of quarters um, and not like years. I, to your point, things like the enterprise adoption took like you know years upon years. And even today we meet lots of like big name customers that are like, yeah, 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 yeah. all our stuff runs on prem. Um, you know, we need to figure out how to be more into the cloud and you guys at Snowflake are great. So compared to that, I think this is lightning fast. I wonder if I get your thoughts. You know, we took this concept of a power law and then applied it to, to generative AI. And if you think about the power law of like the music industry, you know, it's a very steep right angle. There's some, a lot of big folks and then a huge long tail. And there's a similar uh, development we think in Gen AI, although open source and some of these other tools are sort of pulling the torso, you know, up, if you will. And so it's more of a, 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 a smooth and then certainly a long tail. But I'm interested in some of the, your thoughts on the domain specific or industry specific models, you know, versus those, those consumer models that we were talking about from industry giants like Google and OpenAI and Microsoft, et cetera. How is that evolving? I mean, Snowflake has visibility on industries. Your, your go-to-market is organized that way and financial services and healthcare and telecommunications and, and others. Do you see that evolving? Are there any industry examples that excite you? Um, I think it is definitely evolving pretty rapidly. Whenever there is a new platform like this, um, people are fascinated by the value. But to be honest with you, I think we are all excited by just the disruption that these things potentially uh, end up uh, end up creating. And as I said, uh, um, what happened uh, since the beginning of this year is that things have gone from only three companies can create meaningful large models to wait, these models are open source. 
there is a lot more creativity. Um, so there are multiple schools of thought uh, on this. I don't have a, uh, a, you know, like I think the jury is still out. Um, I think uh, incumbents are actually going to realize a lot of value um, from AI. Like since the beginning of the year, it is pretty clear that neither Bard uh, nor ChatGPT is going to replace Google search per se. Um, and Bard, um, which is uh, Google's chatbot, is getting better by the day. It's not rolled out to everybody, um, but it's actually it is it is it is it is very good. So there's one school of thought that says that you know this knowledge is spreading so rapidly, and companies are so ultra aware of the disruptive power of AI that they're going to be very quick to um, absorb use that uh, that technology at Snowflake. Um, we certainly are at like the cutting edge of using all of these technologies, many of them developed in-house, but also with partnerships into our products so that our customers can use them. Um, we're also looking into partnerships um, with companies uh, like uh, Landing.ai, for example, Andrew Wing's uh, company. Andrew, of course, one of the foremost people um, in deep learning. They're interested in image models um, that can do various kinds of feature detection and also video models. Um, you now can integrate that uh, deep within Snowflake using, using our extensibility platform called Container Services. Um, so we do see these kinds of specialized applications. Um, people also ask us a lot about, hey, can we get a fine-tuned model on top of the SQL model that you have created so that it becomes better at understanding my schema is able to generate better, uh, you know, better SQL. I think, you know, one likely outcome is that the, uh, the large platform companies like Snowflake, uh, obviously AWS, Google, and Azure are going to get really, really very good at figuring out the industry specific use cases and it doesn't lead to large scale disruption, um, say that the internet uh, created or even that mobile created when, you know, when the world went from desktop computers to Android and iOS are the dominant mobile platforms. I wonder if I could ask you, you mentioned on-prem before, um, there's a sort of debate going on in the industry about where these things are going to take place. Obviously inference at the edge is, is a big topic. I was at a Dell financial analyst meeting earlier this month and you know, that was a big discussion amongst the financial analysts is like, where is this going to occur? Of course, Dell would, would make the argument that, well, you know, there's a lot of data on-prem and, and the, the, you're going to bring the AI to the data on-prem and we have solutions there. And of course, you know, Amazon would say something different. You're obviously all cloud, very, you know, much prominent in, in the AWS uh, uh, ecosystem. Do you have yep. any thoughts on that? Are customers actually saying, hey, because of privacy, we actually want to do something on-prem, how can Snowflake help us? Or are they, or is it just a matter of like the cloud making them comfortable with, you know, doing this in the cloud? Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, look, uh, yes, we are 100% cloud, but um, for the most demanding, um, the most finicky customers, we are also perfectly happy um, to basically do like virtual instances that are dedicated for them so that there's nothing else in that, um, in that deployment. Uh, so as far as customers are concerned, we feel like we have a really solid story um, when it comes to, can you be on, on cloud? But I think you're asking a larger architectural question, um, which is what is the um, essentially like distribution um, of GPU capacity um, between server side things um, and what can happen at the edge on individual computers. Um, you probably know this, but your iPhone actually has a fair amount of GPU capacity. This is how things like Face ID work. It's a pretty, you know, there's three clever models that, uh, um, that help them do this. Um, so I think that is too early to call. Um, I think people like uh, Intel and AMD um, but also like Apple, because they design their own, uh, you know, own chips, um, are going to be looking uh, to push more of the inferencing functionality um, to the edge. There's also a race to develop smaller models um, that can be um, that can be very useful. For example, with speech recognition, there is little reason why that has to happen at the cloud. There is very good reason to think that that inferencing can be done right on the device. Um, I think there will be value created by the big models. Let's face it, while Llama 2 is great, GPT-4's reasoning ability by all accounts, including mine, is unmatched. 
So I think there will be a little bit of this hybrid world where some functions will live at the edge, um, other functions will be in the cloud, but a lot of these complicated technical questions can only be settled with like data and rollout. And we are in a world um, where stuff is just evolving very, very rapidly. Um, so I don't, I, I don't think we can quite call it just yet. Yeah, and I, I well, for those who, and I very much do know that this thing includes a lot of really power, like you say, a GPU, there's an NPU in there, a lot of accelerators and the combinatorial performance is amazing. Followers of my breaking analysis program know where I stand on this. I think AI inferencing is going to be enormous at the edge and I think ARM is going to be, you know, a key platform for that. And I think it's going to, it already is in my view, rippling into the enterprise. In fact, you're taking advantage of things like Graviton, you know, whether or not, you know, that data comes back to the cloud or maybe, you know, someday Snowflake figures out, okay, how do we actually participate in that remains to be seen. But I think, as you point out, it's very unpredictable. Uh, and it, and, and it's, it's those use cases and deployments that are going to actually determine what act, what really happens. Um, I'll give you the last word, uh, Sridhar. We're, we're out of time. I really appreciate, you know, your thoughts on this. What should we be looking for uh, going forward and, and maybe some of the key milestones that you want to hit and, or other things that we should be excited about? Um, at Snowflake, as, as, as I said earlier, we get really excited about democratizing data access within the enterprise. Um, that's the point of being a, uh, that's the point of being a data cloud, um, but not in a way that everybody is comfortable so that there's the right governance and so on. Um, so we have a series of things coming out in the AI space that are, that are going to further uh, that mission whether it is analysts just being able to do a lot more with their uh, data, um, our tinkerers um, and app developers being able to spin up apps very quickly to the most complicated of, uh, you know, I need a vector index, I need this, you know, middle layer, and I need fine-tuned language models for my own use. Uh, we are excited to be uh, enabling things, uh, things like that. Um, you know, we think of ourselves as the iPhone platform for data where stuff just works, um, stuff is very well put together. We are very proud of the fact that there's one Snowflake product, not a set of disparate products. That's the lens that we are applying to AI. Um, but I got to tell you, as a technologist, this is such a rapidly moving space. Um, you're going to see, uh, see us do a lot more things, um, whether it is... Uh, you know, taking advantage of mass fine tuning capabilities so that more personalization is possible for more customers. And there's a whole pile of other things that are, uh, that are coming on. Um, it is really exciting to be at the center uh, of all of these discussions, to be talking to customers pretty much every single day uh, about it. Um, I'm like a kid in a candy shop. Uh, it's uh, pretty fun times uh, and lots of value to be created. Yeah, and it's our pleasure to be following this and reporting on it. Sridhar, thanks so much for participating in SuperCloud 4, really appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Looking forward to everything coming out. All right, keep it right there for more action live from our Palo Alto studio. This is Dave Vellante for John Furrier. You're watching SuperCloud 4 on theCUBE.